Hi everybody, this is uh, Gad Saad. Uh, two days ago on December 26th, I uh, found out with great regret that the legendary and astounding scientist E.O. Wilson had passed away. And so I wanted to take a few minutes to pay homage to the, the great man that he was. Uh, he's actually been incredibly influential in my own work but I wanted to give you a bit of a synopsis of some of the key uh, accomplishments. There are too many to recount here, but just I'll just discuss a few. So I guess the first thing that I'll say is that when you talk about evolutionary psychology, which is basically the application of evolutionary biology and evolutionary principles to the st study of the human mind, there are other fields within the evolutionary behavioral sciences where you study human behavior from an evolutionary lens. So there's Darwinian anthropology, there is mimetics, there is uh, behavioral ecology, there is ethology, and there is sociobiology. Sociobiology is the, um, biologi the study of the biological basis of social behavior. And so in 1975, I tried to go through my personal library, and I'm certain that I missed several other books by E.O. Wilson. This absolute masterpiece... 1975 sociobiology by e.o wilson is a is a true bible because it goes through an explanation of how you study social behavior from as i said a biological basis now that book became unbelievably controversial because in the last chapter and i think it was chapter 26 he applies the sociobiological framework to study human behavior and hence this is known as human sociobiology. And so it, this is exactly what I talk about uh, when I discuss the human reticence effect. It's perfectly okay to apply evolutionary principles to explain 1,999,999 species. But if you apply it to study one species called humans, well, then you are Himmler and you're a Nazi. And so E.O. Wilson, in daring to apply uh, incredibly... Uh, rigorous and profound evolutionary principles to explain incredible animal behavior, inc including some very puzzling animal behavior. Once he used that framework to uh, apply it to human behavior, then he was a persona non grata, which of course is exactly what you see 45 years later with evolutionary psychologists. If you apply a principle to study the evolution of mating behavior of the salamander, then bruh, you're a great scientist. If you apply the exact same mechanism, the same methodology, the same epistemology to study the evolution of human mating in humans, well then come on, bruh, that's just faux science. It's Nazi science. It's pseudoscience. And I have written about why people have these emotional and cognitive obstacles to accept the application of evolutionary principles to the study of human behavior in much of my scientific work. But in any case, so check out 1975 Sociobiology. It's, it's, a, it's a dense book. It's not easy to read, but it's incredibly uh, powerful compendium if you really want to understand the genesis, the root of what then led to the offshoot of evolutionary psychology. The next unbelievable book, arguably... I mean, definitely one of the most important books that I've read in my life that I have used. So, for example, in my first book right here, The Evolutionary Basis of Consumption, in the last chapter, when I talk about the benefits of Darwinizing consumer behavior, well, I talk about it will lead to a field that is more consilient, meaning that it has more unified and organized knowledge, where, well... Consilience, 1998 book by E.O. Wilson, is where I learned of the word consilience. Consilience basically means unity of knowledge. And he was basically arguing that you can create consilience across disparate disciplines. Not just disciplines, say, within the natural sciences, but you can build bridges between the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. And of course, not surprisingly, the way that you would do that is through the unifying force of evolutionary theorizing. So again, his, his, his importance, not just within his technical work. Now, remember, he's an entomologist in terms of his technical work. He's a, 
an expert on social ants, one of the quotes that I most love to quote about him, which I cite in this book, is uh, socialism slash communism, great idea, wrong species, right? It's a great idea to have socialism where everybody is equal, except, of course, the reproductive queen, for social ants because that's how they organize evolutionarily speaking their societies it's not a great idea for humans because humans are hierarchical we're we, we're not all equal some are taller some are shorter some work harder some are more lazy some have green eyes some have blue eyes and so therefore to try to uh, peg us into a economic and political system that we're simply not evolved to flourish in will lead to repeated failures as we've seen the failings of socialism and communism in every place that it's been tried. So again, that, that little pithy quote is incredibly profound, which leads me to a third book, one of my absolute favorite books. And many years ago, I was supposed to get her on my show because she wrote a biography on uh, Hamilton, uh, Bill Hamilton, who is a extraordinary evolutionist uh, and the developer of the theory of kin selection he passed away, uh, I think, in 2000. He, I think it was maybe he contracted malaria. He was working on uh, a study of the origin of the AIDS virus, if I'm not mistaken. And so she wrote a biography on him. And I had said, hey, uh, I'd love to invite you on my show. This was many years later. But the original place where I discovered her, her name is Ulika Segestrale, is Defenders of the Truth, the Sociobiology Debate. Incredible book. If you want to see the origins of the culture wars, remember, I often talk about that what led me, what the, the, the genesis of when I wrote The Parasitic Mind is when I first in my scientific career, 25 plus years ago, when I was trying to introduce evolutionary psychology into the business school, into, into the study of psychology of decision-making, into the study of consumer psychology, into the study of marketing in general, uh, I faced a lot of uh, resistance, right? People didn't like the idea of applying biology and evolution to the study of consumers and managers and financial traders. What are you talking about, Dr. Saad? This is not a biology department. Uh, well, E.O. Wilson faced this in the 70s, because when remember I told you about this, his sociobiology book, well, of course he's saying that of course humans are driven by biological and evolutionary imperatives. Well, his colleagues at Harvard, some of whom were themselves evolutionists, like the late Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewontine, they were Marxists. So they felt that uh, the application of evolutionary thinking to human behavior did not fit their uh, Marxist ideologies, hence they were parasitized. That so you see where the 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 origins of me seeing these this parasitic thinking came way before the the woke stuff. It started off in my scientific career, and later that I see the war on reason, you know, infiltrating every nook and cranny in academia. Well, this book traces in a in a really beautiful kind of historical narrative all of the stuff that E.O. Wilson faced at Harvard with the famous case where a, a bucket of ice water was thrown on him where he had to go around campus with police protection. And so he was one of the, the original OGs against the uh, all the woke stuff. So when you think about Thomas Sowell fighting the feminists in the 60s and 70s, E.O. Wilson is fighting all of this, you know, tribal, parasitic, ideological garbage within academia he was there now it's a shame for me that you know someone like eo wilson's uh, fame and influence did not mix it up more on i i was going to say on social media but i guess he was uh, quite of an advanced age at that point he when he passed away two days ago he was 92 years old so maybe one shouldn't feel uh, too disappointed that he didn't take to twitter and instagram and so on but his voice is so gigantic that it would have been great to see him weighing in on many of the issues that we face today, which, you know, he was facing way back when I was, you know, 11 and 12 years old. And then the fourth book I was going to tell you about is The Naturalist. This is his autobiography. It came out, I can't remember, I think maybe in 1994. Uh, it's just 
he's just an amazing guy. I mean, he's a Pulitzer Prize winner, twice Pulitzer Prize winner. He is uh, a recipient of the Crawford Prize, which is the prize that is given to any scientist for a field that is not covered by the Nobel Prize. And so you could pretty much chalk up to him having had a Nobel Prize, so to speak. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to uh, hear him speak once. I think it was at the American Psychological Association meetings, um, you know, maybe 10, 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. I can't remember exactly when it was. Uh, he just, he has, he had such a grace about him, such poise. Uh, I had always, uh, you know, uh, dreamt of having him on the show, but was always tepid to write to him, never thinking that, you know, he might be open to such a thing. I do know of a fellow evolutionary psychologist uh, who did uh, tape a series of talks with him. Uh, hopefully this will come out in a book, I think, that they're working on. Uh, but, you know, from, from a historical uh, posterity perspective, he truly ranks right up there amongst the biggest scientists of the past 100 years. And I think what I admire so much about him is that, you know, he truly is the the model of intellectual that uh, I think that we should all aspire to be, which is, of course, he was a serious, narrow researcher, meaning that, you know, he, he did stay within his lane when he's doing the research on social ants, but he was, he was a get out of my lane kind of academic in that he specifically wrote to the to the masses, to the general public. Many of his books have been read by hundreds of thousands of people precisely because he was able to communicate beyond the medium of the you know peer-reviewed journals. And again, I'm not denigrating that. I think, of course, original research has to go through the that particular mechanism. But I think that if you have something important to say as a scientist, hopefully you can also look at the possibility of using all of the other vehicles at your disposal to reach as many people as possible. And that's what I do. Sometimes I'm austere and professorial. Sometimes I'm a joker. Sometimes I'm sarcastic. All of this is in the service of trying to hopefully uh, infuse people with knowledge and, of course, make them happy and make it fun and engaging and so on. And so from that perspective, E.O. Wilson, phenomenal scientist, extraordinary public intellectual, wonderful writer, huge synthetic thinker and so many of you ask me to you know provide you book recommendations i just gave you four that should keep you busy for a while uh my deepest condolences go out to his family i'm not sure that they'll be watching this clip but i thought that it would be it would be the least that i can do to make this clip to honor the memory of truly one of my intellectual heroes a man of great grace outlandish talent and endless accomplishments. Have a good day, everybody. Cheers.